Good morning, everybody, and welcome. The, I've been asked to state for the recorders that the date is Wednesday, April 10th. The time is 9 a.m. This is panel 3005 of the 2018 Conference on World Affairs and is entitled International Nuclear Disarmament. Our panel will run this morning until 10.20 a.m. My name is Brian Taylor. I'll be our moderator. I'm a professor in the Department of Communication. I'm also the director of the campus's Peace, Conflict, and Security program. For over 25 years, I've been a scholar of rhetoric and culture surrounding U.S. nuclear weapons development, and so it's an honor to work this morning with our very distinguished panelists. So allow me now to introduce them. First, Joe Cirincioni is president of the Plowshares Fund and has worked on nuclear weapons policy issues for nearly four decades in a variety of leading positions in the U.S. government, private foundations, and policy research centers, including the Stimson Center, the Carnegie Endowment, and the Council on Foreign Relations. He is a prolific author whose most recent book, Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It Is Too Late, was praised by Publishers Weekly as a, quote, gripping, harrowing account of the arms race debate, and Joe himself by another reviewer as, quote, a clear-eyed, straight-talking, highly influential sage on the spread of nuclear weaponry. His commitment to public edu education includes appearing on the Colbert Report, where he did his very best to keep a straight face. That's right. That's right. Okay. Our second panelist is Beatrice Fenn, who is executive director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN which is the collective recipient of the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. Pause. <laughs> In its announcements, the Nobel Committee praised ICANN for, quote, its work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and for its groundbreaking development of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Principally, this treaty prohibits its signatories from developing, testing, producing, stockpiling, stationing, transferring, using, and threatening to use nuclear weapons. In July 2017, 122 member nations of the UN General Assembly voted in favor of the treaty although none of the world's nine nuclear states or their principal allies chose to do so. The treaty is now being ratified by its signatories, most recently Kazakhstan. Beatrice is willing and able to quote famous rappers if need be. Third, please welcome Susie Snyder, the Nuclear Disarmament Program Manager for the Netherlands-based PAX organization. PAX is a partnership between the Inter-Church Peace Council and PAX Christi, and is committed to protecting civilians against acts of war, ending armed violence, and building a just peace. PAX is one of ICANN's international partners and supported the treaty initiative by placing, in many ways, but one principally by placing a related citizens initiative in the Netherlands on the agenda of the Dutch parliament. Ms. Snyder is also an expert in the global companies that produce nuclear weapons and the institutions that finance them. According to Google Images, she is also a close friend of the superhero known as She-Hulk. We'll begin the panel with some opening comments. Uh, I've asked uh, the panelists to share their thoughts on the current state of the international nuclear nonproliferation regime and the challenges that nuclear opponents face in promoting the agendas of nuclear nonproliferation and abolition agendas. We'll begin with Joe. Thank you very much, and thank you all for getting up so early to, to come and talk about these issues with us. We all greatly appreciate your presence I'm going to do two things in, in about five minutes. And the first is do an overall state of the regime. Where are we in our efforts to control the most horrible weapons ever invented? And two, maybe a, a, a state of the movement. What is happening 
to, for people who are opposed to nuclear weapons, where are we in the efforts to reduce and eventually eliminate these weapons? The state of the regime is grim. It, it, I don't think in my almost four decades, this is true, I've been doing this for a long time, I don't think I've seen it quite this bad. I, you really have to go back to the beginning of the 1980s, 82, 83, when there was a ferocious arms race underway between the Soviet Union and the United States. And both sides were deploying new nuclear weapons and, and pouring them into Europe at a rapid clip. A dozen or so new weapons were added uh, every week, it seemed, into both Western Europe and what was then Eastern Europe. And that spawned a mass movement against this arms race. Here in the United States, it took the form of the nuclear freeze movement, but there were ban the bomb campaigns in every European uh, capital. We're back at the arms race period. Every single nuclear armed nation, and there are nine of them, is building new nuclear weapons. There are no talks underway about stopping this arms race or uh, reducing the arsenals. Most of the new, of the approximately 14,000 nuclear weapons in the world are held by the United States and Russia, so they have the greatest responsibility, and they are shirking that responsibility. No talks, no dialogue, no hint of talks. The last time the U.S. and Russia talked seriously about reductions was in 2010. Um, and we also face challenges to new nations who want these weapons. In, in, in North Korea is the most obvious one, where North Korea has violated its treaty commitments under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and gone ahead and, and built and then tested new nuclear weapons. And the answer to this, the, the most likely response that we're going to get to this is the possibility of a war between the United States and North Korea. Not a treaty, not violations. Yes, we've had sanctions at the UN, but it's clear that the international system is, is straining to try to contain the North Korean program, provoking the constant threats of, of U.S. military action against North Korea should it continue. The bright spot in this picture had been the agreement with Iran. This was a new addition to the non-proliferation regime, which is a network of treaties and commitments involving hundreds of, of, of nations with, with dozens of restraints on the export of nuclear materials, the possession of nuclear weapons or materials, pledges to reduce, pledges not to test. And then with the Iran agreement, we had a new, a new deal, a new way of stopping a nuclear uh, a, a state from acquiring the capability of going nuclear. N Iran did not have a bomb program, but it had a robust civilian program that was producing a uranium. And the fear was that they could turn those uranium fuel plants into uranium bomb plants. And that historic agreement stopped that program in its tracks, rolled it back to a fraction of its original size, froze it for at least 15 years and more if we do our duty and follow up with supplemental agreements to extend those restrictions, and then put it under an, an intrusive inspection regime. We stopped the Iranian program, but we now face a threat to that agreement from one of the signatures, and that is us. The United States is threatening to pull out of that agreement. Most of us expect Donald Trump to violate the agreement or directly pull out of it sometime next month, throwing the agreement into a, into a profound state of uncertainty, probably collapsing the agreement, and with it, weakening the nonproliferation regime. Okay, that gets us to the response to this. What do you do uh, if, if you're a country or if you're a citizen who sees the insanity of this arms race and wants to stop it? Well, there historically have been waves of protests against nuclear weapons, and we're now seeing a new wave building. And I just want to describe very briefly my encounter with this wave. So I run a foundation, Plowshares Fund. I've been president for 10 years, and we fund a wide variety of groups who are doing work on these issues. Expert groups like the Arms Control Association who do expert an analysis. Media groups like we think uh, media who helps people communicate their messages and, and, and helps book people on TV shows and, and get their op-eds placed in, in newspapers. And also advocacy groups like Win Without War, for example, or the Friends Committee on National Legislation, people who are lobbying the Hill to push legislation. We 
have not seen a group like ICANN in a very long time. And when we first encountered ICANN as plowshares now back in 2013, 2014, we thought this was an interesting group. They seem to be doing some interesting work. Uh, average citizens, regular people, um, uh, working away on this obscure issue, the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, not focusing on the stability or instability of nuclear weapons, not focusing on the strategic rationale or insanity about deploying it, but looking at what would happen if you used one of these. We've all been horrified by the pictures out of Syria of 50 or 100 people being gassed by a weapon of mass destruction, by a chemical agent. A nuclear weapon is exponentially worse. It would kill on the scale of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people would suffer death in the most horrible way imaginable. And this is what ICANN was focusing on. And they worked with governments, and this was kind of unique among a mass group. They weren't just having protests, they weren't just doing actions, they were working with committed officials in, in dozens of countries to pull together international conferences on this. And I went to the third one that they did. I was a little late to the party. I went to the third one in Vienna in December 2014, and I saw, I, I don't know how many countries were there, maybe 100 represented there, including for the first time the United States and Great Britain, nuclear weapon states, who agreed to, to come to this conference. And that was impressive, and it's a, it was at a beautiful palace, it was, you know, it, it was a, a bright spot in the otherwise bleak government meetings on, on nuclear weapons. But what impressed me the most was the civil society meeting that ICANN was having on the side of it. And I walk into a room about the size of, of Mackey here, not as nice, uh, and there must have been 300, 350 people there. And I was stunned that this many people would come to Vienna and turn out for this conference. But what really got me was that when I walked in the room, I significantly a raised the average age of those people in attendance. This was a young group, a vibrant group. Uh, minor Amer the Americans were in the minority. These were Europeans, these were Asians, these were Africans, these were Latin Americans, people I hadn't seen involved in this issue except at the most official levels. And it was the room that was, was charged with energy. After going to that meeting, I went and wrote an article for a, a publication I published in called Defense One. And my basic message was something is happening here. And what it is isn't exactly clear. But you could feel it, for the Buffalo Springfield fans in the room. You, but you could feel it, you could feel the energy. So we then, after talking with various representatives I can, gave them a, a, a fairly modest grant for us to help help them out, and we did it again the year after. But I gotta tell you, we never thought it was gonna pay dividends like this. We never thought that they could do what they did, that they could work with these countries and get them to, to agree in, uh, on a treaty banning nuclear weapons. No such treaty had ever been proposed, let alone agreed upon. And it was a stunning achievement last year when 122 countries agreed to do this. And it was even more surprising, and I think Beatrice will tell you, she might, might have been the most surprised of all, when the Nobel Committee awarded them, awarded them the 2017 Peace Prize. We have had grantees in the past who have won Peace Prizes, including Physicians for Social Responsibility, the people, and the people who worked on the landmine campaign, but not like this. Not, not like this, not so quickly, not so powerfully, and, and not at such a critical moment for the nuclear regime. So we've been proud to support ICANN. We, we, they have repaid our investment in, in them a hundredfold. And I hope you'll pay close attention to Susie and Beatrice, because this something that was happening there is now happening globally, and this wave is just beginning. It is just at the early stages of, of, of building, so it's not too late for you to join it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Joe. Beatrice? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I feel a bit awkward because I know I'm on a, like a really giant screen, uh, which makes me feel, feel like, you know, a little bit scared of the camera here. But uh, it's really, really nice to be here. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, just didn't work out travel schedule wise. Uh, and great to see Joe and Susie uh, there. I mean, I have to say, aside from loving all the kind words to Ike that Joe said, um, agree very much with his sort of assessment of where we are internationally right now. It's an extremely concerning 
period where all the nuclear armed states are upgrading the nuclear arsenals, building new types of nuclear weapons, really challenging quite established norms. We have, in particular, a few of them openly threatening to use nuclear weapons. And the consequences of that it would be horrific. I can't help to, to see it sort of the, um, the bizarreness of being outraged by chemical weapons, very rightly so, we should be really outraged by that, while at the same time threatening to indiscriminately mass murder hundreds of thousands of civilians with nuclear weapons. And it comes from this idea that we treat nuclear weapons a bit differently than other weapons, like they're not really weapons. They kind of isolate it from logic, from normal rules and laws. They're special, but they're not that special. I think that's really one of the approaches that we have in ICANN. They're bigger and more destructive, but they're just weapons. We build them, we can take them apart. So while we're seeing this very extremely concerning atmosphere in the international community where some governments are trying to undermine very well-established norms and trying to take us back to the Cold War. Um, and the risk of the use of nuclear weapons is higher than maybe ever at this point. We also see at the same time a really positive development. And I think this is like, not just on nuclear weapons, but I think we see that across politics at the moment right now, where we might have some people in power that are doing, trying to take us back, but social movements and people are on a completely different level and are resisting and, and shifting the way we think about things. I think that's where we have to put our focus and our energy on. Uh, it's extremely tough to change politicians' minds. But at the same time, when people change their minds, they will follow. And right now we see a huge kind of uh, in particular in the United States, but also over Europe, a very sort of political awakening and a, a sense that we can't leave these issues to politicians only. We can't just go and elect a president or a prime minister every fourth year and hope that they will do the right thing. Because they won't, unless we make them. So what ICANN has been trying to do is really to, to mobilize people. We are a broad campaign consisting of people from over 100 countries. And just regular people, uh, not celebrities, not presidents or prime ministers, just regular people gathering to make a difference. And that has really worked on this issue. It has worked on other issues. That is how change and is happening. So the way we've been working is really in, in many different ways. We have campaigners that are activists that climb up on buildings and drop big banners in sort of Greenpeace style activism. We have people that are researchers that are producing uh, research and reports and kind of technical expertise in that way. Uh, we have people that are almost like lobbyists. They go around to parliament and, and work with political parties to get things going on a national level and everything in between. And it sometimes doesn't feel like what one individual do, does that matters. But together, when everyone pushing in the same direction, I think we had some experience of that also in the Iran deal and the work that went into securing that is to gather all these different actors and push, make a big push in one direction. Uh, you can have an ex a huge impact. Um, so really what we're trying to do in the campaign is to make it easy for people to get involved in this issue to make it accessible. This is not something that you have to have a PhD in political science in order to get engaged in. Uh, we want to talk about nuclear weapons uh, in an approachable way uh, and really try to mobilize this kind of groundswell of support to change policies. And what was really the kind of tool that we do that through is the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Because we kind of forgot to ban nuclear weapons. We have banned chemical weapons because of their indiscriminate inhumane impact on civilians, biological weapons, landmines, cluster munitions have been banned, but yet somehow we made all of these excuses around nuclear weapons, that they're special, they don't, you know, these, this idea that normal rules don't apply to them. So the whole idea behind our campaign was to, stop, to draw a line in the international community 
that between those that think that these weapons of mass destruction and threatening to mass murder civilians is acceptable and those that do not. Um, and then start picking off state by state, moving them to this side where nuclear weapons are unacceptable. And the treaty was adopted uh, last summer and it is opposed by the nuclear armed states. They have no intention on joining it anytime soon. Uh, but that doesn't have to be a problem in a way because international law also works normative and their opposition to either even non-nuclear weapon states signing on to this treaty shows that they understand as soon as there is law, they are on the back foot. They are going to have to justify to the international community why they continue to possess an illegal weapon. And we like to compare it sometimes to, to smokers. Uh, we didn't ban smoking inside when every smoker had stopped. But the non-smokers said, fine, keep smoking, we will go outside. We can only stand in the cold and in the rain, and it's going to be really boring out there. And we'll sit here and be a little bit healthier in here. And it doesn't mean that the smoking doesn't exist forever, but it just makes it a little bit difficult for them and stigmatizes. And very quickly, you change your mindset. People think, people tell me very often, oh, but it's naive. Nuclear weapons are never going to be eliminated. And I think it's, um, it's really a, a weapon that is very vulnerable to, to mindsets. It's a very impractical, uh, mainly symbolic weapon in many ways, which also means that stigmatization of the weapon is really important. And just imagine the, with a smoking ban, how natural um, it was for people to sit inside in a restaurant and smoke. Not too long ago, and as soon as you've made that law, how quickly it changed. And just imagine today, sitting in all of this conference room, someone picking up a cigarette and smoking. I mean, it would be bizarre. 20, 30 years ago, that was, that was fine. Oh, maybe not in the US, I don't know. In Europe, that was fine. Um, restaurants, fine. Uh, people sat everywhere. So it's, it's just, I think that there's an extreme, there's a power in stigmatization. There's a power in changing norms. There's a power in rallying the majority to stigmatize certain behavior. Uh, so what we're doing right now is that we're really working to pick off one government at a time, get them to choose sides. Are you against weapons of mass destruction that targets civilians or are you in favor? And by pushing each country to sort of tip this balance and getting the majority of states to clearly reject this, we can put a lot of pressure on the nuclear armed states. We can launch divestment campaigns, for example, which I'm, I'm sure Susie will talk about a little bit. Um, and lots of activities. We're going to get a lot more questions in parliaments in those countries that have not yet signed this treaty. It's like, why is our country defending an immoral, illegal weapon? Why are we putting money into this? Why are we um, putting our own population at risk around the areas where these weapons are based and stored, for example? So I think it's like really trying to channel public pressure and trying to uh, create a situation where it's going to be much more attractive for politicians to start disarming. Uh, and that's really the, the kind of work that we have ahead of us right now. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to people. Susie? Yeah, thanks. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, and good afternoon, B. <laughs> um, so that was a great opening, and, uh, and that's kind of fun. Um, I, I like to do stuff a lot, uh, and that's one of the things that I think has been the best part of working in this campaign, is that we do stuff, and a lot of different stuff. Um, and Beatrice touched on that. Um, and it is because it is a, a campaign of a, of a lot of different people with different specialities. And in doing stuff, uh, one of the things that I work on is the divestment angle. And Bea gave me the great opening on that. And so we have this project, it's called Don't Bank on the Bomb. Why? Because we think that people, oh, is that, oh, that's better. Oh. Hi. All right. So, yeah, so let me come, let me, don't bank on the bomb. All right, so we, we think that it's not the greatest idea to profit on the production of nuclear weapons. Because nuclear weapons aren't made just by governments. 
there's a lot of private sector involvement, a lot, especially here in the US. And so we decided, well, let's figure out exactly what is the level of private sector involvement. We publish this information. What are the contracts? How long do they last? How much are they worth? You know, the US government committed, uh, what is it, $70,000 a minute, every minute for the next 30 years? $70,000 a minute on new nuclear weapons. And where does that money go? Some of it goes to private contractors. But it's not enough for them to be able to do everything they need to do to get the contracts. They need to, to kind of do some research and, and development. They need to get private investment. And who pays for that? Yep, banks, pension funds, asset management companies, you know, they're investing in these companies. And so we name them. We put out a list every year. And most of the companies, we, we profile, you know, not only the US nuclear arms, but also we look at the French contracts, we look at the British contracts. Our, we have a criteria, we, we can't get information about every country. And in some countries, they have made it illegal to allow that information to be public. And we don't want to hurt our partners, we don't want anybody to get thrown in jail, uh, you know, unless they choose to. Uh, and so we, um, we, we can only publish what, what we can get and what we can verify, and we're pretty strict. Uh, and so we find some of these companies like BAE Systems. BAE produces components for the American arsenal, the French arsenal, and the British arsenal. They hit the trifecta. Um, and so that's one company. And there's others, there's Lockheed Martin, not surprising, Raytheon, not surprising. Boeing doesn't just make airplanes, <laughs> they make nuclear missiles, woohoo. Uh, yeah, so we try to, try to get information about that and then we push and get financial institutions not to invest. And since the adoption last year on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, we saw a 30% increase in the number of financial institutions that refuse to invest. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. They said, oh, whoa. okay, so if these weapons are illegal or, you know, there's, there's this new treaty, this maybe, not a, maybe isn't the best idea and maybe we won't do a service to our clients. We have a fiduciary responsibility to make them money. Maybe we don't want to invest in something that is illegal or that is harmful. So that's, that's pretty good. We're, we're getting, we're making some leeway. And it's doing stuff and it's a chance to, to get people involved because when we talk about nuclear weapons, it is overwhelming and disempowering and freaky. Like these are massive weapons designed to kill people and you know, with one bomb, even the smallest bombs kill mass hundreds, tens of thousands of, of people. And that's not cool, in my perspective. You may have different, uh, I don't know. Um, so we're, um, this is a way for us to put that stigma about you know, this is unacceptable into action. And it's a way to, for everyday people to do something. And we work with partners, of course. Uh, so we can't, we have kind of limited capacity uh, you know, it's me and, and a colleague that's half-time that does this research and this report. And uh, so we work with, with and need our partners. And we have a partner, the Future of Life Institute, that puts out the information about U.S. mutual funds. And that is so helpful for people in the U.S. that want to make sure their mutual fund investments are not connected to controversial weapons. They, and they go beyond our don't bank the bomb. They list nuclear, they list landmines, they list cluster bombs. And this is, is a great resource if you're invested in mutual funds because you're a responsible person that cares about your retirement, you can check. If you have a bank account, you can check. Does your bank invest? You can use our websites, don't bank on the bomb, you can check. Um, or you can do what I did on Monday morning. <laughs> I walked into a bank and I said, hi, can I talk to the manager? The manager said, hi, how, I can, how can I help you? Do you want to open an account? And I said, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, are you a subsidiary of somebody else? And do you have a policy on investment in weapons? And specifically, does that policy include nuclear weapons? And she said, um, we are a subsidiary, and I have no idea if we have a policy, but let me find out for you. 
Okay, it took less than five minutes. I, wa I was did while I was walking to the conference on Monday morning. I was like, oh, let me just check. Um, took less than five minutes, started a conversation with somebody. Um, now there's an invest, now she's gonna send a note up the line and there's gonna be a conversation in this bank whether or not they have a policy. And that's as easy, that's, that's as easy as it is. That is how we got the, one of the biggest banks in Sweden to develop a policy, by asking a simple question. Do you have one? If not, why not? And sometimes we can't get politicians to do stuff but we can get the financial sector to do stuff, and that brings up this whole of society support. It puts that stigma into action. We see two major US institutions now responding to, um, to the use of uh, assault weapons um, and saying they won't invest. Larry Fink from BlackRock said something about not investing in these things, and Bank of America said something yesterday about not investing in this. This is a, an, a pressure point, it's, they're open, they don't want to be stigmatized, they don't want to be associated with horrible stuff. And nuclear weapons are horrible stuff. So, I realize I use the word stuff way too many times. Um, my apologies, I still want you to do stuff. Um, I want to help people to do stuff. And I, I noticed that, the, um, that one of the mottos posts around here is be bolder, bolder. And I think it, we can get bolder all the financial institutions in Boulder out of the nuclear weapons game if we're just a little bit bolder. I'll end there. Thank you, Susie. Your, your comments are very well taken because if I'm correct, the city council is contemplating taking up a resolution about banning particular classes of weapons um, within Boulder. Oh. So uh, maybe somebody can uh, uh, add a couple of words um, to the phrase. We, we're doing well on time. Um, this is an opportunity for the, uh, the panelists to elaborate uh, before we get to your questions, which by the way, we'll be taking both through the use of note cards and also through the app, which you may have downloaded onto one of your devices. If you locate the name of the panel, and if you wish to submit a question, uh, you could use um, that app, and I will be looking at those shortly. Quick question? Uh, what about it? Divestment? Sure. Well, so if you could hold on to that question, sir, we'll get to it in just a bit. Um, for the moment, I, I'd like to spark something, if I could, just by playing devil's advocate. And I would ask the panelists to consider um, a frequent argument that's made by the nuclear states to justify their continued possession and modernization. And that is that it's around, of course, deterrence. And the argument is that, of course, um, as you're probably familiar with, nuclear weapons not only deter the use of other nuclear weapons, but they deter um, uh, possibilities for conventional conflict as well. And the nightmare scenario that often gets floated is if we abolished nuclear weapons, we would somehow return to a 1945 state um, of, uh, you know, uh, of relative anarchy in which nations are free um, to pursue conventional conflict. So that's their argument, and I'm wondering how you folks um, respond to that. Uh, I'm going to ask Beatrice to give the first response, because this is really one of the core issues. And so we, we spend a lot of time talking about this and thinking about this. but. Uh, Beatrice, I know in, you've been traveling around the world both before and especially after you got the Nobel Peace Prize. So you've been, you've been having these conversations. Could you, why don't you give your answer first? And could I ask you to move a little closer to the microphone and the computer so that we can, we can hear you just a little bit better here? I want to be Thank deeper you. than I am already on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I mean, obviously this is... Uh, this is um, a question we get a lot and you know deterrence there it has been debated over and over decades people write academic papers and theses on this first it's very hard to prove the absence of something uh, absence of war and then you can also question what kind of war uh, there hasn't been an absence of war in in other countries and it, it's it's a very, you get very quickly into a theoretical debate, which we think are quite really unhelpful and makes it very abstract. Uh, for me, the, the main issue, if you believe in deterrence, 
you have to be credible in your threat to use nuclear weapons. Otherwise, deterrence doesn't work, right? Um, so that means you are prepared to use them. A lot of people that are proponents of deterrence talk about how it's, well, and they were not actually supposed to use them. They're just supposed to deter, but they don't deter unless you're actually ready to use them, which means that the likely the possibility of using is higher than zero. I think that's really the one of the key here. Having nuclear weapons means that they might be used. And the impact of that is what should dictate our response to nuclear weapons, not perceived theories around what could possibly happen or not happen and what has not happened. So I think it's very, very important to whether or not deterrence might work in certain conditions or not certain conditions is not really relevant because it won't last forever. There will be an accident one day, uh, even if it does hold up forever. And the consequences of that is how we should look at it. Uh, there have been numerous occasions where we've been, have, we've been so close to nuclear war, not just situations that we all know, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, but also just accidents, miscalculations. There's been um, false alarms that have almost triggered a detonation in response. Um, deterrence doesn't work like that, in, in, it doesn't work for cases like that. Uh, deterrence works if you have sane people in power, perhaps. Do we? Hmm. It, it's just like the, the, when the stakes are that high, uh, you can't just rely on an, a theory that is impossible to prove. You have to look at facts. You have to, have to look at expertise. And the facts are when you use these weapons, and they are targeting civilians. They, are, you know, they might say that, oh, it's for military targets, but you don't have 15,000 nuclear weapons so with the average size bigger than Hiroshima for military targets. These are meant to wipe out entire cities of civilians. That's what they're meant to do. Um, so they will be used one day. Uh, and that's the question that we should ask our politicians. What, for what? How? How does that make us safer? What would the consequences be? Who's going to clean up after that? Uh, what do we do after they're used? Uh, we have had these conferences that Joe talked about where the ICRC, for example, the UN humanitarian agency says, uh, we can't do anything. We will pull out our staff. So even if you do survive a nuclear detonation, the, you won't get any help because this will be contaminated by radiation. And just look at Hawaii, for example, uh, that just happened a few months ago, um, where there was actually people thinking that there was an incoming missile, that they had 20 minutes left to live and how terrifying that was and how that was a mistake again. Another mistake that happened. What if that had gone directly to Donald Trump, for example? Or what if that had gone to uh, Kim Jong-un, thinking that it's, uh, it's staged to you know, launch an attack on us? I better respond first. Uh, the stakes are so high that we can't just rely on deterrence here. Let me, let me just add to that. And there's two points. One is, when I was at this conference, the uh, humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons in Vienna in December 2014, I heard a remarkable speech by the representative of the Vatican who was delivering his remarks on, on behalf of the Pope, Pope Francis. And they backed up the remarks with a series of documents. And in those documents, the Catholic Church shifted its position on nuclear weapons. It had been in development for some time, but this really sort of formalized it. The Catholic Church has always held that nuclear weapons are immoral, that it is against the laws of God and man to use weapons like this, the, the, that indiscriminately target innocent civilians. But they had made a cutout for deterrence. During the Cold War, they said, look, it, it, we struggle with this, we don't like this, but this helps keep the peace, it helps keep the balance. So during the Cold War, they decided, you can possess nuclear weapons for the purpose of deterrence. And in 2014, they changed that position. They said, no, not even for deterrence purposes. For all, for the, for, and they went to, an, a, 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 I encourage you to read these Vatican documents because they're, it's, it's not just a moral stand, it's an intellectual stand. They do exactly what B 
Petrus said. They said the, the only way deterrence works is if the, your adversary thinks you're ready to use them, and the only way they'll think that is if you are ready to use them on a minute's notice. So you start, you drill these weapons, you, you practice using these weapons, you make as automatic as possible in a process involving human beings the decision to launch these weapons. You integrate these weapons with your conventional military uh, operations. And and in so doing, you bring humanity to the edge of extinction. One nuclear weapon would be horrible. A hundred nuclear weapons could cripple human civilization. When you start talking about the use of a thousand nuclear weapons or more, you really are talking about the end of human life on this planet, or certainly the end of civilization. And said so nothing justifies that. And so then you confront this argument, as I confronted uh, just a few months ago at a conference in Washington, I was on a panel with a, a brigadier general who was the deputy commander of the uh, strategic command. And we would, had an exchange back and forth, and then he turned to the audience and he said, nuclear weapons save lives. And I thought, wow, this is good. This is, a, you know, the, the, the ex deterrence, existence of nuclear weapons has prevented horrible combat between the great powers for over 70 years. So if it wasn't for nuclear weapons, we would go to war. And this is, a, this is what you call a frame. He wants you to have the discussion within that frame. So let's do that and argue that, Joe. So then it turned to me. And the argument against that is that is isolating one factor in what has happened over the last 70 years. It's true. We have not had great power conflict. But why is that true? Is, got, is that because people have feared nuclear weapons? Look, I'm going to say that is a factor. The existing possibility that a war could go nuclear has been a restraining factor, but there have been a good dozen others, including the alliance system that the United States built with its, with its allies, including the economic relations that tie countries together, including a shift in cultural norms. And when you think about the great powers, the idea that France and Germany would go to war with each other is inconceivable. But that is exactly what France and Germany did every generation from when before there was a France and Germany, when it was just Franks and Goths. And they don't do that now. Why? Because they fear a nuclear war? No. Because they bounded together in alliance systems and economic uh, systems that, that, that enhance their security, that enhance their economic health, that create an environment where they are closer together than they've ever been before in their history in a variety of ways. So you realize that the, the argument that deterrence saves us is, is, is wrong factually, and as the Catholic Church demonstrates, it's, it's, it's wrong morally. You cannot justify the existence of these, women, of these weapons and claim to still hold true to the moral values that, that many of us hold. This is a deep, a deep conversation that is, uh, it goes on, I, I can tell you, it goes on in Washington every day, and, and thanks to the, result, the, 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 the movement of people like ICANN and the involvement of religious leaders, the Catholic Church is just one of many religious religions that have taken stands against this, you see this concept spreading. Most people don't realize the Catholic Church has taken this position, it's been fairly recent, but it's there, it's real, and Pope Francis is deeply, personally engaged in, in this issue. Just ask Beatrice, who sat next to Pope Francis one. A couple of months ago, I saw your tweet about it. And she, 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 you know, when you got Pope Francis on your side, you got a pretty powerful force going for you. Thank you. Can I just add something there? Yeah, I also want to add something. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a, one little thing, which is that um, this is suggesting that these countries that have nuclear weapons haven't had any wars or haven't been involved in any wars. And uh, is that, did, did somebody, like, have I been living in an alternate reality? Because I think that in particular the U.S. that has almost most of them in the world, Russia has more, and Russia also, they seem to have been involved in a whole lot of wars uh, since they've had nuclear weapons. So maybe not with each other, directly, but they sure have been involved in war, and you can, you know, talk to any, any soldier's mom, and she'll tell you how that feels. Yeah, can I just add something as well? Sure. Yeah, just, just in, because I, I was really intrigued by something that Joe talked about, and, and 
I think that deterrence is also, it's kind of a sign of a very old fashioned way of looking at security, um, which in many ways are similar to things like culture or um, human rights abuses. This idea that the state in the name of security gets to do whatever it wants to people. Uh, and we live in a new society today. Uh, it's the 21st century. We don't let the governments um, just commit what kind of atrocities they want in the name of security. Who's security? Are we talking about the people in the defense ministries or are we talking about human security in a way? So I think it's, it's also about deterrence doesn't protect people. It protects a certain thing in, in their mind, but you can't just indiscriminately mass murder civilians and say security. Because that's not how security is today. One last story, because it gets to uh, one of the points here about what happens when deterrence fails. And this is, um, I like to think about deterrence as a very nice theory that works great until it doesn't. And then it fails catastrophically. And you, we've talked about the nuclear risks, the accidents, the near misses. And we think that all happened during the Cold War. But in 1995, after the Cold War, when the US and Russia had excellent relations, we came real close to thermonuclear war. 1995, Boris Yeltsin is the, is the president of Russia. The Norwegians launch a weather satellite. N Norway, the home of the Nobel Peace Prize, they launch a weather satellite. They had told the Russians they were doing this. They had given advance notice, but the information hadn't gotten all the way up to the military, the top of the military chain. And the military saw this and interpreted it as a US submarine launch ballistic missile that was heading towards Moscow, that was the beginning of a nuclear strike. And in some scenarios, that's exactly how one would begin. One missile, very large warhead, exploded over the territory of the country to blind the radars, followed by hundreds of warheads coming in. And for the first time in, in the nuclear age, the Russian military went to the head of the country and opened up the nuclear football, opened up the command and control me mechanisms for launching nuclear weapons, and told Boris Yeltsin we were under attack and he had to launch. All he had to do was say yes, and hundreds of, of Russian missiles would have been launched at the United States under the mistaken belief that they were under attack. Fortunately for us, Boris Yeltsin wasn't drunk. He did not believe the military was right. He didn't think his friend, Bill Clinton, would do that. They waited. There was no explosion. They closed the football. We're still here. But it was that close. How are U.S.-Russian relations today? The President of the United States tweeted out this morning that U.S.-Russian relations are the worst they have ever been including during the Cold War. What would Putin do today if they made that same mistake? What would the US do today? And that's the risk you run every day by clinging to this fallacious notion of deterrence that nuclear weapons save lives. No, nuclear weapons kill people. That's why they're here. We can't let this threat continue to dangle over us. So one of the themes that you're all touching on in one way or the other is that um, the success of the campaign seems to rest on our willingness to tolerate vulnerability. Um, because we have been living for close to 60 years in an experience of security that makes that intolerable. Um, one of the paradoxes that surrounds that seems to be about how we think about rationality and irrationality. So one of the double-edged swords for nuclear states is characterizing themselves as rational, and then other particularly nuclear aspiring states like North Korea as irrational. And it seems like that might, they, uh, the states might find ways to stigmatize the movement by saying that there are some actors who are rogue and who are inherently irrational. Um, and of course, then that begs the question, why would they respond to deterrence? But the question that gets framed, and thank you, Joe, for, for raising that issue, is why should we believe that an international campaign would be capable of influencing those 
irrational rogue actors. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to just um, say a few things about that. Um, I mean, I think first of all... A little closer to the microphone, please. Yeah, I mean, first of all... Yeah, okay. Um, you touch upon the, the, one of the additional flaws of deterrence is that if they keep us safe and are so great, then everyone should have them. Why are we scared of North Korea then? We should welcome it. It should create peace and stability in the region. Obviously, it doesn't. It actually create. We have a situation where nuclear weapons are fueling conflicts rather than preventing it. Uh, so that that's really one of the problem. And this kind of idea of irrational actors, rational actors. Again, certain world leaders in the armed states right now makes that you know difficult to judge from a distance who is rational and irrational today. And but I think that what, what we see is that. Norms do work also on non-democratic states. Uh, it doesn't work as straightforwardly as in a democratic country where you have civil society, um, sort of political conversation uh, that is free and open, but it does work. And I think that that's, for example, what we see now with Russia and chemical weapons, for example. They try to create this kind of smoke and mirror and, and questioning facts and because they know that they can't just admit to what they're doing. They have to cover it up in a way. Uh, if you use weapons that are illegal, it, you can't be proud of it. You can't brag about it. So you have to lie and say, well, actually it was terrorists that did this or it's a scam. And, and it shows that these bombs do have an impact also on them. They have to relate to them and keep, I'm not saying that they will immediately uh, abide by them, but you can see how they are pressured to explain themselves and find excuses and um, try to come up with these alternative facts in a way on, on what is actually happening because it's not acceptable even for a state like North Korea or Russia to just admit to doing these things. I mean, North Korea's arguments about nuclear weapons sounds an awful lot, a lot like the US arguments. We need it for protection. We need it for security. We need it for this and this and this. And we will get rid of it when there are no threats on the horizons in the same way as other states. So I think it's really, you see that these treaties do impact. Uh, and you can look at the treaties on the landmines and cluster munitions. Countries like China and Russia haven't joined those treaties, but it, it has still impacted the behavior. It has shifted the way they look and use those weapons. People don't appreciate how much work has been done on arms control and nuclear reductions. They forget that in the 1980s, when we're in this arms race, there were 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world, 70,000. We had almost 30,000 nuclear weapons of all kinds. We had, we had not just nuclear missiles and bombers and submarines, we had nuclear depth charges, nuclear torpedoes, nuclear cannons. And so did Russia. We were nuclear nuts. You look back at that period now and go, what were we thinking? But it was exactly the same arguments. We had to have these weapons. We couldn't cut one of them. We couldn't cut one, because that would make us weaker. And that would give Russia an edge on the escalatory ladder. And we have to control escalation at every stage. It's, you look back and you see how ridiculous those arguments were. And here's the good news. We did something about it that rationality prevailed. Even before the end of the Cold War, Ronald Reagan, a hero to many of the people in this country, a man I underappreciated. I did not believe Ronald Reagan when he said, nuclear weapons are immoral, that nuclear weapons should be abolished from the face of the earth, that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. I didn't believe him, I thought he was scamming us, but he meant it. From the moral core, he meant it. And he cut US and Soviet nuclear weapons by 50% with the treaties he started. And H.W. Bush, his successor, continued that process. And, as, and this has been continuous. These reduction talks, these international treaties, we, the countries of the world passed a comprehensive test ban treaty saying no one should nuclear test. And even countries that are not party to that treaty, like North Korea, they suffer international prohibitions for testing something they're legally allowed to do. They're not a party to this treaty, but the whole world condemns them for testing a nuclear weapon. 
Hmm. So now, as a result, we've got a steady, steady downward slope over the last two, three decades. But we've, we've paused. We're not going down anymore. We're at 15,000, 14,000 in holding. There were nine nuclear nations in holding. And so the question for us is, uh, we're at this tipping point, this pivot point. Which way do we go? Do we go back up? Or do we continue that, that slide down? And international treaties and prohibitions and norms and citizens groups and, and, and moral authorities and right-minded governments make a huge difference in this fight and will depend on which, which way we go in the years ahead. It could not be a more critical time to be engaged in these issues. And I thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here for, with us. Yeah, and I do just want to add one, one thing um, to reinforce that issue of the norms and what makes a norm happen. And, and I think that's something that it's really important for us to think about because it's not just one thing. And, we, and there's a combination. There's the building of a legal architecture um, that makes a norm. So now we have a legal architecture that's building that makes nuclear weapons illegal, that helps create a legal basis for their unacceptability. But that isn't enough by itself. So there's also these additional pressures that um, from society, from citizens, from moral leaders, from the Pope, who also said the possession of nuclear weapons is immoral. That's what he said last November when he was sitting next to Beatrice. And the, the very possession is immoral. And that builds this norm of unacceptability. And I think we see this in other social movements. We see what is acceptable, what is unacceptable, and we are empowered more and more. As the world gets a bit better, we're empowered more and more and more to say clearly and definitively what is acceptable and what is not, and do whatever we can to make the unacceptable unthinkable and then a relic of the past. And I think that's what we're doing here with nuclear weapons, um, among many other things. Time now to shift to your questions, which I'm reading both from the app and from the, the cards. Um, they're falling into uh, at least two camps, um, one very supportive and a couple skeptical. Um, so why don't we see if we can go back and forth. Um, uh, uh, the skeptic question uh, for the moment has to do with verification. And so these are the pragmatists who are um, cautious about pursuing the ideal. Uh, until they can have faith that violations uh, can be detected and addressed. You can go back to Reagan, right? Trust but verify. <laughs> That's that was his. Wasn't that his uh, yeah. his legacy motto? Yeah. Um, I, I'll just I'll jump. Quick. There's a lot of work that's going on around verification right now, uh, and verification is important. But again, we're forgetting about the norm. When nuclear weapons are so unacceptable, we also have built other sites, other types of verification. When we see, for example, the use of other unacceptable weapons, it's not, and it happens sometimes, but not as often. We see it's not only governments that are indicating this, but the norm is so strong that there are many people who are identifying and challenging that use and making that information known externally. Um, and known outside of the country. And that's something that I think it's important to, to remember as, it's, um, as we move towards this. It's not solely going to be the, the realm of governments um, and international agencies, but also a societal verification. You know if there's a plant that goes up in your neighborhood that seems to be doing some shady business, you start talking about that and asking questions. Um, and I think that's, that's a, just another piece of that. But I know that you guys both have you and Bea, I'm sure, have both have lots of thoughts on verification stuff, too. I'll be very quick, and then Beatrice. This is a tough issue, and, it's, and I'll be honest with you. We don't know how to verify the absolute elimination of nuclear weapons. It's the, what they call the bomb in the basement problem. You know, what if everybody gets rid of their nuclear weapons, and then suddenly Canada announces it has a nuclear weapon and wants to renegotiate the Treaty of 1812? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what do you do? <laughs> Those Canadians, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and there's two, 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 at least two answers to this. And one is, as we get closer to this goal, and as we go, we down 
to a few thousand, a few hundred, we, we, our verification tools will improve and we'll have to develop the mechanisms. But a lot of this is going to be based on very intrusive inspections that right now states are not willing to accept. But in the end, if you eliminate nuclear weapons, you're going to have to have very intrusive inspections that will compromise states' uh, sovereign rights. And the other is one nuclear weapon isn't going to change the balance of power. Because the fact is that even the countries give up nuclear weapons, we in the United States have the most powerful military force the world has ever seen. We don't need nuclear weapons for deterrence. We can kill a whole lot of people real quick, which is the weapons we have. So it's, it's, it's as, these are not magic weapons. We shouldn't imbue them with more power than, than they have. They are, as Beatrice says, they are, they're special, but they're not that special. A question from a student uh, asking about the concept of nuclear winter. So uh, asking for the panelists. How's that? Yeah. Better. A question from a student asking about the concept of nuclear winter. Asking the panelists for some information about the, the impacts of both limited and maximum uh, exchanges um, as far as dust clouds and crop production and so forth. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to say a few words about that. I think it's the, what it is really unique about nuclear weapons, like they're not magic, they just big dirty bombs, but the radiation of course can spread um, across borders uh, over generations. And also if you bomb these kind of cities, big cities with nuclear weapons, you have additional, um, you have the fires, because the, the core of a nuclear, nuclear weapons explosion is so hot that it will burn everything, and put every, the whole city on fire, which will today create so much soot that it goes up in the atmosphere and can cool the climate, which means that this is not an issue that just is between the nuclear arms states. If Russia and the United States go to full-scale nuclear war between each other, we all will be impacted. The, the kind of, the, there's been a really great research done lately also on um, a limited exchange of nuclear weapons between India and Pakistan, where 50 nuclear weapons each will be used. And it will create a cooling effect that will impact crops of corn and rice for over a decade, putting over a billion people at risk for starvation. And this is what really motivated countries in Africa and Latin America and Asia to to work for the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Why should they pay the price for something that they have no control, like that the, these other countries have decided they need to have uh, when it will be everyone who, who gets impacted. And in, in that way, it's a little bit like climate change uh, or, or smoking in that way, that it also impacts the people around. It is not just for the nuclear arms states uh, to suffer if this will be used. It will impact people all over the world. So I think it's a really, important statistics that it's not just about the immediate casualties but these in the impacts of nuclear weapons will stay for generations and i just want to point out um there has been amazing uh, research done on this including by someone who's in the audience right now uh so i just want to give a shout out to to brian toon uh who has done some of the the best research on this and um if you haven't seen his tedx talk specifically looking at this it's 15 minutes of your life that you are going to be grateful you spent checking out and learning the the nitty gritty details about this stuff because i i can't explain it as well as he can and this is a man who's here at University of Colorado, and a resource, a resource for everyone. We have, several, we, have several questions. we have several questions from the audience about the chances that the U.S. will use military force to intervene in North Korean nuclear weapons production. Military force. Uh, there's a very high probability of this. Uh, we, we currently are in a peace phase uh, because of the Olympics, because of the shift in policies of the North Korean leadership, because of the diplomatic work of the South Koreans. We currently have a moment here where we have the possibility of a, a, a diplomatic solution to this. A lot is riding on the summits 
that will happen at the end of this month between the leaders of North and South Korea and uh, next month or early June between the President of the United States and, and Kim Jong-un. I cannot wait to see that photo op. That's really going to be something. Uh, but if, the, if this peace process fails, if this negotiation fails, if these compromises fail, th there is a very strong push in this administration to use military force. The people who had been against this are shrinking in number. The National Security Advisor of the United States, McMaster, was against this. He's gone. The Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, was against this. He was gone. We only have Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, who warns that a war with North Korea would be a level of violence that is beyond the living memory of most Americans. We're talking World War II levels of destruction, millions of people killed in weeks. And that's if it stays conventional. And yet some people believe that we should, in fact, bomb North Korea now. And one of those people is John Bolton, who this week began as the National Security Advisor of the United States. Another is Mike Pompeo, who's facing a confirmation battle in the Senate to be Secretary of State. I was there with him in Aspen just last summer and heard him say that we, we have the ability to separate Kim Jong-un from his nuclear weapons. And people said, what? What do you? And he said, well, I'm not going to say any more than that. But this is the mindset of some of the leadership of, the, of the, this administration, that there's a military solution here that you can do, do this. So yeah, we, we are closer to war with, with North Korea than any time since the last war um, ended. I think Joe said yeah. very well. Same question then, Iran. Here's the thing with Iran. <laughs> Yeah. So there's there's a bunch of things about Iran, uh, and other, one of the complaints that I've heard and and heard people say is that you know the the joint comprehensive program of action doesn't deal with all of the issues about Iran. And can I just remind folks, it wasn't meant to. Um, it was meant to halt the Iranian nuclear weapons program, which it is doing. Uh, so the the thing is with Iran, there is an agreement in place. And everything we can do to hold on to that agreement is a good thing. Breaking that agreement delegitimizes any, any diplomatic efforts to stop other nuclear weapons programs. You're saying if you can't uphold this agreement that you worked so hard with your allies and others uh, to, to get, um, what, 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 uh, what, what good are you <laughs> in the international diplomatic scene? And it's also something that, if you think about it, it brings together the US, China, Russia, the UK, France, Germany, and Iran. It's, it's, a, it's this nice little cluster of countries that some of which we're not having, the, the US is not having such great relationships with at the moment. So it's, it's a good idea to hang on to. So uh, in terms of war with Iran, it's dumb and don't do it. And can I, can I just add um, something that is just really remarkable to watch from outside the US? I mean, this, this deal was really remarkable when, when it came. Um, and I feel sometimes really frustrated when, I, when people criticizing because Iran has the toughest safeguards and inspections out of everyone. I mean, do you understand how lucky we were that they actually agreed to that? They, because in a way they didn't have to. Other countries aren't held to that kind of high standard. So, they, I mean, it's just really, really a remarkable deal. Um, and it would be dangerous for the United States. It would be dangerous for Iran. It would be dangerous for the world to give it up. But also this idea of ripping up this part is a very, this deal is a very, can do a lot of analysis on the, disdain for diplomacy and diplomatic solutions. That somehow having a win-win situation is bad. That somehow we have to punish the others by, you know, this you know, some kind of idea that by them getting benefits out of the deal is somehow bad. 
it, it's a very um, somehow compromise the negotiations with a deal that both can live with that gives benefits to both would somehow be worse than bombing people. It's a completely, you know, mad idea of solving problems that we can only accept problem solving that sort of humiliates the opponents or, you know, crushes them, kills them in a way. That is extremely dangerous. Uh, you can do a lot of gender analysis around this, like sort of like a masculine kind of idea of uh, getting what you want through force rather than getting what you want through compromise and, and a win-win situation. But I just think, I mean, it's just very hard to watch this from outside the United States where you just kind of feel this is just insanity. Why would you rip up that deal? Like you, you're not going to get a, it's, 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 yeah, it's just really, really stupid, as you said. A question from the audience regarding terrorists and other non-state actors. It's um, not clear whether or not states are able, nuclear states are able to deter them from their goals of acquiring and using nuclear weapons. Um, but also, um, it seems that it would pose a problem for international movements uh, to get them to the table and to um, get them to participate in agreements. Thoughts? We had a whole panel on this, uh, I think Monday, where we talked about this. And here, let me, for those of you who didn't attend, let me boil it down. It's really hard for a terrorist group to make a nuclear weapon. In fact, it's impossible for them to make it from scratch because they can't make the stuff. They can't make the plutonium. They can't make the highly enriched uranium that form the core of these bombs. They, that requires a state-level enterprise, billions of dollars, uh, m m millions of gigawatts of, 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 of uh, gigawatts of energy. But if they can get the stuff from a state, then they could assemble a crude Hiroshima-type bomb. So the answer to, to the international terrorism is not letting them get the stuff. And one of the ways you do that is reduce the availability of that stuff. And one of the side benefits of making nuclear weapons illegal of a ban treaty and reducing the stockpiles is you then reduce the facilities that are making the stuff for the bomb. And the ones that remain, because there are some civil, and you, and you have to phase out any civilian uses, there are some for highly enriched uranium, until no one is making highly enriched uranium. No one is making plutonium anymore, and the stockpiles that remain, you can get rid of the highly enriched uranium fairly easily by turning it into fuel rods for reactors. And the plutonium you have to guard and then store in deep geological deposits to get rid of it, but you can get rid of this stuff. And so that eliminates the ability of an international terrorist group to do it, so you don't need them at the table. You can solve the problem perfectly well without them. To add to that, if you think about it, there's also, we've been lucky that it's still holding the stigma against the use of nuclear weapons. Using nuclear weapons does not, right now, win people to your cause. <laughs> it's not a way to, you know, convince, change hearts and minds over to join your, your struggle. And if you look at it um, from, from that perspective, I think it's, it's also, it's not a logical tool for a terrorist um, in that way, because it doesn't kind of, kind of build. Um, and so that's just another, another side of it, but I agree, you know, keep the stuff out of people's hands, uh, super helpful. Well, I think it's, they've covered it. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Also anticipated another question from an audience member about fissile materials and about how, um, if they were extracted from existing weapons, how might they be disposed of? Um, conversion to, to fuel. I wrote a um, report on this. Poses oh, its own issue. Yes, yeah. go ahead. Um, I wrote a report on this a few years ago. Doing it. We did a cost-benefit analysis of what happens if you dismantled all the existing nuclear weapons in the world. What could you do? And we figured that you could run the existing nuclear power plants for three years um, based on just what's in the weapons in arsenals today. So that's about how it is. And we used, uh, we used the data from, there used to be this great American program called the Cooperative Threat Reduction, that what they did was they took old materials from inside Russian warheads and then powered the southeastern US uh, off of that, converting it into something that's still highly dangerous, extremely toxic, don't get me wrong, but not usable in nuclear bombs. Uh, and so you know, it, was, it, was a, it was an interesting exercise. Let me, let me just add to this. So 
we had a, this is the value of international agreements and what you're going to accomplish by with, with agreements that you can't accomplish by military force. We had an agreement with Russia where we bought 500 tons of highly enriched uranium from dismantled warheads. 500 tons. And then we blended it down with natural uranium until it was low enriched uranium and turned that into fuel rods and sold it to American power companies. One out of every 10 light bulbs in this room is, is lit by electricity that came from Soviet warheads that used to threaten us. They call this program megatons to megawatts. So you get about 20% of the energy in the United States comes from nuclear power plants. We have 100 of them. And about half of the fuel in those plants came from this program. Is that the Nunn-Lugar agreement, Joe? No, it, it was related to that, but it was a supplemental uh, agreement. It's related to the cooperative threat reduction programs that Republicans and Democrats have supported for several decades now until the Republican Congress defunded it a couple of years ago. You know, Republicans used to be really good at disarming stuff. Reagan, the first Bush, you know, got rid of a lot of weapons. I don't know what happened. Might be a question for another panel. Yeah. We're getting close to the end of our time. Uh, we, we may have time for uh, at least one more question. The question is about ballistic missile defenses. A question about the extent to which they continue to um, support deterrence and about the environmental impacts that might be created should an interceptor strike a missile in flight, um, causing its warhead to disperse. Can I just start Yes, with I would like to use start how this looks to you, how it looks to Europe. Um, I don't actually know about the environmental impact, so maybe someone else can talk about that. But first of all, if the terrorist works, then why neighbors did missile defense? <laughs> I mean, it's just sort of like, it just kind of like just admits that the terrorist might not work. Um, so I think it's just, and, I mean, they have all of these studies, and I don't have the figures in my head, but you know, they even miss when they know when the missile is coming uh, in the tests. There's been many cases where they can project it very, very accurately because it's their own test and they still miss. So it's extremely expensive, um, doesn't seem to be uh, working very well. Uh, and it's just, again, this kind of like attempt of solving these problems that we could just fix from addressing the root causes than actual nuclear weapons. So it's just... Uh, I think it's an extremely expensive waste of money uh, in itself, an admission that deterrence doesn't now hold up forever, uh, and just a signal that we need to get rid of the weapons. The other thing is, um, just look at, yes, yes, uh, what Beatrice said, uh, and also, and look at, I mean, to, to be able to hit a, a missile, which is moving extremely fast with another missile, um, the, the question is what's the environmental impact of this? And that relates to are you going to cause a nuclear, are you going to cause that, that nuclear weapon to detonate? Um, and that's, I don't know. I mean, you had, there were, there were, there were um, dropped nuclear weapons uh, in, you know, both here in the U.S. There were bombs that, you know, oops, fell out of planes, oops. Um, also off the coast of Spain, oops. We lost some nukes, whoops, um, and they didn't detonate. So, you know, maybe, I don't know, how do you, if it's, it's really difficult to hit a, a speeding bullet with another speeding bullet, how do you make sure you're not making that first speeding bullet explode if it's one of those dumb, dumb shells? And that's what we're talking about, and that's just, that's bonkers. Two quick things. We've had over a thousand acts, serious accidents with nuclear weapons, including losing them, dropping them, etc. So we now make our nuclear weapons what they call one point safe. So if you hit it with a hammer, it's not going to go off. Got it. Does North Korea do that? No idea. Uh, if you intercept a missile, does it go off in space? Pro probably not. It's probably not fused. It's probably not armed until it re-enters the atmosphere. So, but you would, you would spread radioactive dust from such an incident. But the chances of actually hitting that missile are quite, quite low. And this, the problem we have is that the President of the United States doesn't understand that. One of the things that Rachel, that uh, Beatrice and I have in common is that we've both been in the, on the Rachel Maddow show. And she had me on several months ago to talk about the President's claim that our missile defense, our missiles could intercept a North Korean missile 
97% of the time. They could hit with 97% accuracy. That is completely untrue. It is completely untrue. It's actually sort of the, almost the reverse. But he believes this statistic. And so you have the danger of a leader of the, of the United States who is profoundly ignorant about nuclear policy and, and, and nuclear issues, and yet has sole unfettered authority to launch a nuclear weapon uh, for whatever reason, whenever the president wants. And if there's anything that illustrates the danger of deterrence, of keeping these weapons around, it's the current situation that we're in. We've, we've got to come up with a better system, and I'm so grateful for the people of ICANN who are working night and day to help us do that. We're close to the end of our time. I just wanted to address the gentleman's question earlier about CU and potential divestment from weapons manufacturing. I don't know. But I know there are student organizations on campus trying to achieve divestment from fossil fuels. If anybody's interested in uh, trying to organize that related movement, um, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to try and get that on the plate of the students here. Thank you all for coming this morning. And thank, please thank our panelists. If you're not aware, there is another panel coming up immediately after this one on North Korea. I'm sorry, late breaking news, that panel was canceled.